Hello and welcome to Travel Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Unseen Histories. This week we're going deep into the stacks of library history. Of all the accomplishments of human civilization, the creation of libraries, making the preservation and transmission of knowledge possible, is surely the greatest. The greatest of them all, the ancient library of Alexandria, remains the gold standard of cultural achievement today, one that haunts and inspires in equal measure. Andrew Pettigrew and Arthur de Verdeven's new book, The Library, A Fragile History, takes on the long and tumultuous history of these noble institutions, from the clay tablets of ancient Nineveh to the problematic Google Books project. This is an unflinching look at library history, one that does not shy away from the neglect, the destruction and the moments when knowledge was lost. In this episode... Pettigree and Verdeven, who are both academics at the University of St Andrews, take us back to 1850, a pivotal moment in the history of public libraries. Increased literacy in the 19th century enfranchised new readers whose taste for penny dreadfuls and trashy romances were absolutely not the kind of books librarians wanted on their shelves. There were concerns about the type of people public libraries would attract, and the dangers of providing them with thrilling rather than improving literature. Education, prestige, preservation, reputation laundering, neglect and destruction. Libraries have fulfilled a huge variety of roles throughout their history, as our guests today reveal. Welcome to Travels Through Time, Arthur and Andrew. Well, very pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Very nice to be here, Viola. Thank you. I'm looking forward to our time travel today. Um, We are going to spend our time in various different libraries. um, And I'm sure a lot of our listeners love libraries, as we do. And we're going to be talking about your book, uh, which is called The Library, A Fragile History. But I think my first question today to both of you is, um, I imagine you visited a lot of different libraries in the course of your research and also in the course of your um, professional lives in general. And so can you um, tell us, do you have a favourite library? And if so, why is it your favourite? Well, uh, I certainly do. Uh, And it's one, a library I went to every Easter for, I think, four years. And it was particularly special because all the family came on the trip and also my uh, uh, also my graduate student, so it was a real outing. And it's the uh, Bibliothèque Municipale, the Municipal Library in Aix-en-Provence, which is based on a fantastic donation uh, given by the local bishop and is one of the world's great uh, collections of 16th and 17th century French pamphlets. So lots of discoveries to be made. But it was a lovely working experience. They were so nice to us. And it was sort of library where the rare books weren't totally separated from everybody else. So you had people coming into the children's library to borrow uh, musical recordings. And it was just a general hubbub and sense of life and vitality, which I so much enjoyed while I was working. Yeah, for for myself, there's been many libraries where I've really en- enjoyed the experience, and and mostly that experience is, is made by members of staff. But the truly unforgettable experience is always for me the Royal Library of Belgium in Brussels, which is a, a federal institution in in, Bel- in bilingual Belgium. So you can speak uh, either Dutch or French. Um, and as a Dutchman myself, I, I learned a great deal about the politics of language when I walked in very happily speaking Dutch to the overwhelming French speaking staff, and they chose to ignore me completely. So once I got over that that faux pas and got to know them a little bit, I realized what a fantastic place this was. Um, because if you go to the, the rare book room where they have all the, um, the special collections, uh, the old, old and rare books, um, and if you ask for a particular item, they don't just give you that book. They also give you the entire shelf that that book sits on. 
um, first of all, to just give you, you know, some, some, some extra things that might be of interest and also to save themselves the hassle of constantly having to go back to the stacks because you've just seen one and you want another one. So it works on both ends. And the best other part is, is that when they, they still have a traditional lunch break. So when the lunch hour has arrived, um, they all migrate to the door of the reading room and then just switch off the lights. And then they stand very quietly next to the door until every reader has gotten the point that this is now time for them to leave. And you get up and hurry out and, and so they can have their uh, well-deserved uh, lunch break of an hour and a half. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's rather an atmospheric place to work. I think you're right. I mean, librarians are some of the most um, fascinating and wonderful and extraordinary people. I, I think perhaps that could be that could be a good book. Um, extraordinary librarians. So I know that you have both uh, worked together uh, before you've written several books together. And before we start talking about this book in particular, can you just tell us a bit about your working relationship and how do you write a book together? I, I, I'm fascinated to know. Well, this is um, well. Our working relationship started because I was I did my um, uh, my postgraduate studies uh, with with Andrew at the University of St Andrews. Um, did my PhD um, uh, supervised by him, um, and uh, and after that uh, we were we were both very interested in the um, in the seventeenth century Dutch Republic, and um, we 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 thought to to get together and and, and write a book about this. Uh, that that was ultimately published as the Bookshop of the World. Uh, by Yale University Press in 2019, and really, you know, how how do we write a book together? Well, it's 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 immense fun, um, and it's also a, and it's a, certainly a process I would recommend to to many other people out there because it's you see it more and more now in the humanities, but it's still not that not that common. But really, um, writing a book together, it has to start with with having a good sense that you both. You both, um, uh, you know where this book needs to go. So the way we do it, we go to our favorite pub in St. Andrews with a sheet of paper and we just uh, plot out the chapters. Uh, and of course, you know, things may change down the line, but to get a good sense together that we come up, okay, this is going to be the structure. This is what we, this is what we want to say and what, what we want this book to be about. And then, um, you know, we, we do a lot of other work and research together. So these ideas mature on their own, on their own and they really develop pace. And when it actually comes to writing them, uh, we simply divide the chapters uh, between us. So I take responsibility for some and for others. Um, uh, the, the writer then goes away. And once they have a full draft of a chapter, they send it to the other, uh, who then goes through it with track changes um, and to improve it, change, add things, whatever. And the rule is, is that the other then accepts all the track changes uh, without any uh, sulking or any other... Uh, <laughs> uh, inconveniences, so to speak. And um, it, it works rather a treat, I should say, but perhaps Andrew has some thoughts on this too. <laughs> Andrew? Well, I mean, it's been... Uh, uh, obviously, I wrote uh, quite a few um, books on my own before Arthur came on the scene, which, but it's been actually a sort of rejuvenation, I think, of my writing style. It's a different skill, writing with a book with someone else, but it's also... Uh, extremely enjoyable because writing a book is quite a lonely experience so to have someone who is equally um, engaged with it all the way through the process is really a joy and it works best I think because we're um, in the same university we have offices which are only five yards apart so you know we do talk a lot about it so when Arthur says we delegate particular chapters to particular ones of us uh, that's true but there's also quite a lot of discussion going on about contents and you know what people say over drinks and to some extent we bring complementary uh, skills uh, to it I mean obviously when Arthur started I'd had a lot more experience writing uh, books um, but he also has a young person's mind and I have to say that uh, as my memory uh, show signs of disintegrating as I get older. I am immensely grateful for Arthur's precision. Uh, and I would uh, say that, you know, I've met an awful lot of young scholars in my time and you know, enjoyed working with them in different degrees. But uh, when you come across a talent like Arthur's late in your career, uh, you find really any excuse to 
get it involved in your work. Well, well, you know, you know how people sometimes write in a book in the acknowledgement to say, you know, oh, I received grateful help from these readers, uh, but any mistakes, many mistakes that remain are my own. Well, in our case, yeah. you can say that we're also grateful for our readers, and any mistakes that remain are authors. <laughs> <laughs> I think it sounds great. I, I, I think it sounds like a really wonderful idea to be able to talk things through. That's one of the things I find about writing is I, I don't have even many friends who are historians. So I'm literally on my own. And occasionally I try and, you know, bore a member of my family with it. And it, yeah, it, I think it sounds like a really, really good way of doing things. So uh, let's move on now to, to the book, which is absolutely beautiful. Can you talk a little bit about how you decided to structure this particular book because as you say in your introduction it is the long and tumultuous history of libraries ac across the world so it's really a global history yeah. um, and it, it, that's a huge subject yeah. so how did you decide to divide up the chapters yeah. and that kind of thing? Well I suppose you always come to a book with a, a sort of sense of what you want to do but you in this case we came with a profound sense of what we didn't want to do and that is we didn't want to write another book about the great libraries in the world, the great library buildings. We didn't want to write a book about, you know, the sorrowful history of the destruction of libraries because that, that seemed to us to be dragging attention away for what was really the core of the story, which I think I would just say is twofold. One is it that the process by which libraries are built, developed, uh, collections are accumulated and then dissipated and put back into the market for other people to make their own collections is actually a, a natural process which goes on over and over through history. So what we're looking at now is not a unique crisis of the library, but a new process of adaption to new circumstances which has gone on all the time since the Great Library of Alexandria onwards. So that was one central issue we wanted to talk about. And the other was inspired very much by our work on, on Dutch books. And that is the sense that the, sto the story which has been absolutely missing is the importance of private collecting to the development of libraries. There's been overmuch concentration on uh, public collections, on beautiful buildings and on the 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 principle of the public library which actually only occupies a, a remarkably small period of history whereas for long periods when public libraries were flagging or going through an existential crisis it was private collecting which retained uh the uh, library history and kept it going through these difficult years yeah yeah, and we really wanted to tell to, t to tell a long story. So really going back to, to the ancient world and, and to the present, uh, in part to do justice to the fact that, you know, libraries have always been part of, of human culture. They're, they're not necessarily, an, you know, an invention of any uh, a specific era. As, as long as there have been uh, um, means of, of bookmaking in whatever a form or material that takes, people have sought to gather together information. Um, it's stored in that form. So whether you're dealing with clay tablets or papyrus scrolls or um, um, parchment codices or, um, you know, now in the digital ebook form, uh, there have always been libraries. At the same time, we want to, to demonstrate that, you know, one of the um, very harsh themes throughout this library history is that every generation thinks that the books that they have collected are the books that are most important and those are the books that are going to stand the test of time that people a hundred years from now or a thousand years from now will look at those books and think wow you know what brilliant knowledge but the sad thing is is that every generation seeks to make the library in its own image and seeks to populate it with the books and texts that they are interested in that they think represent um, um, the right sort of knowledge and so charting that um, that contest in a way between different generations um, um, and, and cultural movements has really shaped our book. But it does mean that there's, um, there's rather a sad tone at times because, you know, there's, there's familiar themes that keep coming up. And those familiar themes are uh, destruction and, and desolation and neglect. And, um, you know, although we talk uh, frequently about um, sort of wanton acts of destruction uh, throughout the book, um, actually the greatest uh, enemy of the library is, is neglect. 
rather than uh, fire or bombing or you know purposeful pillage. But do you think, isn't it true, although it is sad, that this um, destruction or loss, it, it's almost necessary. I mean, if we had managed to hang on to every single book that was ever, every single scroll, every single piece of, you know, clay tablet, or, or it's just not sustainable. There yeah. has to be a certain amount of loss. And I think one of the things that struck me in your book, and I know we're going to talk about this a bit in a bit more detail later, is, you know, th- you can't just say, oh, well, it's a collection of books, therefore it is useful and important to keep. Because there, there were there's plenty of examples of collections of books which weren't useful. And if people aren't going to read them and aren't going to use them, then what are they for? Unless they're particularly valuable artefacts or they're extremely, you know, there's some kind of value in the artistic decoration of them, then it's just a waste of money keeping them, isn't it? And And that's a kind of hard difficult thing to swallow but i think it, it is true yeah no i think you're i think you're absolutely right and if you talk to any librarian uh today you'll you'll know very quickly that one of their core responsibilities and duties is what they call weeding uh mm. which is to you know take out books from the collection and, and decide what has to go um and the, the, the sense that you know everything everything should be kept like you say it's just, it's it's impossible to do that um and it's yeah and that's why you need need um trained librarians to be able to make uh, the right decisions on what needs to be weeded, because it is a very careful um, uh, process. Uh, and of course, we think when we think about libraries, uh, we think about books, uh, physical books, but of course, uh, in modern libraries, um, especially copyright libraries, a lot of the um, material is digital. And I wondered if, but before we um, get in our time machine, if we could just talk a little bit about knowledge collection and storage today um there's a very interesting um bit in your sort of final chapter where you talk about google and their project um a google books project so can we just talk a little bit about that before we go back in time i think this is an enormous problem for librarians um the multiplication of texts is already severe uh, simply with the amount of uh, of print in existence, but if you have to catch any every manifestation of knowledge on social media, um, changing with extraordinary rapidity, it's extremely difficult to do this, particularly for those libraries which um, have attempted something close to a universal coverage in the past. Um, because that is simply not conceivable with all these uh, digital platforms. It also reintroduces us to the to the sense of fragility, because really for about a century, people have been talking about the death of the book, that it will be replaced by other mechanisms, such as the microfilm uh, or the CD-ROM or the uh, um, iReader. But what tends to happen is that the book sort of forges relentlessly on while these pretenders to the throne disappear altogether or become unusable. Well, yes, exactly, because you get the format then becomes unreadable. I can't believe that anyone who's actually used a microfilm could have ever suggested (laughs) that it was going to replace the book. No, really, really. (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I wish I wish you had been there, Violet, in, in in the United States after the Second World War, so you could have advised vast <laughs> library committees and and government that they shouldn't bin all their nineteenth century newspapers and should uh, actually maybe keep hold of them uh, rather than just microfilm them. Yeah. So, yeah, it makes me feel seasick whenever I use those machines. Anyway. Um, so yes, that's obviously a big um, going to be a, the big issue of the next um, the next chapter in the history of libraries. Um, Right, let's go now to your chosen year. So can you tell us uh, which year are we going back to, please? We're going back to 1850. And can you give us um, a sort of general overview of what was happening in 1850 before we go to your first scene? Well, we're going to start in in Britain. So 1850 was the the, the sort of, not quite the zenith, but a time in the development of Great Britain as as the great commercial power in the world, already a hugely powerful naval power, uh, though not necessarily a military power. Um, and also of London coming to the fore as the uh, cultural capital of the world. 
a title I think it had uh, taken over from Paris as a result of the French um, Revolution, which of course had destroyed a large um, amount of the accumulated legacy of French culture, um, and also uh, led to a sort of disillusionment among those who who, who particularly admired the French in Enlightenment that it had come to this. In in London, we have now some of the greatest novelists of all time beginning to come to their zenith, and then a whole um, a cadre of younger. Uh, aspirants beginning to work their way into it, uh, in, in, into it. The beginning of the age of railways, one of the great ages of newspapers. Uh, so a time of enterprise, but also of poverty and uh, industrial poverty in, in, in particular, and people wondering how, what to do to bring the, the, the benefits of, of, of civilization to these new industrial populations living often in, in conditions of some degradation. And can you give us an idea of literacy levels at this point? Because it was also a, a great age of, um, sort of mass education, wasn't it? It was the beginning of that. I mean, we didn't have compulsory primary education in 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 Britain till, till a couple of decades later. But nevertheless, you're quite right that this was uh, an age with a massive expansion um, of reading and also critically when the g- literacy gender gap uh, between men and women began to be fully closed. I mean this had been going on for some centuries but the times when 90% of the readers would have been men were long gone and of course this created not only new talents in writing but also a huge audience for the sort of books which had not been um, in existence before and the huge growth in the market for uh, fiction, uh, but also worrying signs, including the development of what are known as the Penny Dreadfuls. These were sensational novels r- written um, for less sophisticated readers. And it was the uh, concerns about the working classes uh, reaching for that sort of um, uh, reading, which partly animated the uh, beginning of public libraries, which was the uh, major feature of uh, 1850. And one final, if I may, one final important uh, note on this is for a bit of context about our subject is that this is also a, an age of rapid innovation in uh, the actual production of books and production of texts. We're dealing here with an age where where steam presses um, have, um, in certainly in, in in busy cities like London or Paris, are pushing out uh, the the hand press techniques that have been around since the 50, largely unchanged since the 15th century and Johannes Gutenberg's uh, new invention. So the steam press is is absolutely revolutionizing um, uh, how the, the quantity of production uh, of books and particularly here here in influencing newspapers and journals. So while you have mass literacy gathering pace, this is very much being fed uh, by enormous quantities of print coming out. And that is presumably m- reducing the cost Absolutely too, yes. And there's also... For the consumer. Yeah, reducing costs for the consumer. Um, and uh, with the railways, um, uh, it can also travel much faster, travel further. Mm. Um, and with uh, changes in uh, paper making, largely from a system where paper would be made from from uh, uh, from rags, uh, you're changing to a, a system based on uh, wood pulp. So the paper, um, quality of paper is deteriorating, but it's also becoming much, much cheaper. Okay. Um, well, I think let's go to your first scene. Well, here we are. We're, we're, we're in Parliament to witness the debate of the Public Libraries Act of 1850. Now, this was a debate in a, a long time in preparation uh, because already in 19, uh, 1845 for the Museums Act, uh, it had been made possible for localities to found a... Uh, library as an adjunct to a museum. But this was the first time that independent libraries had been authorised to use public taxpayer money in order to um, uh, facilitate the building of a local library. 
Well, you, you might think that this would be uh, cantering through um, the House of Commons. So I should say that the um, uh, rebuilt Houses of Parliament, um, which had been necessary after the uh, Parliament burnt down in 1834, uh, had not yet been completed. The House of Commons wouldn't move into the chamber we know as the House of Commons until 1852. So they were in what was called the Lesser Hall. So presumably very crowded, uh, so may have discouraged some members from attending the debate. And there was uh, an unexpected degree of opposition to the passage of a bill which would enable local corporations to raise a, a, a rate, a local tax, specifically to build libraries. There was a, a bit of sort of back backwoodsman opposition. Colonel Sibthorpe, Member of Parliament for Lincoln, uh, said that he couldn't really see the point of it. As for himself, he'd never much enjoyed reading when he was at Oxford. Um, <laughs> but uh, the bill was also opposed by the members of uh, Parliament for uh, both Oxford and Cambridge universities, on, in their case, because it didn't make provision uh, for book buying. It would purely be to erect the building. And they wondered, you know, if this sort of half measure would work. But the real problem was that this is a period of social reform and huge infrastructure projects. And there wasn't necessarily a sense that libraries should be um, uh, sh should be privileged ahead of other forms of uh, social reform or indeed facilities for the population. Uh, so two crucial amendments were, were made, which would be very damaging. One was that this would, in the first instance, only apply to communities over 10,000 people. And the other was that they would need a referendum approved by two thirds of the local ratepayers in order for this to take place. And in fact, the reservations were borne out because in the years immediately after uh, the, the bill, very few local communities took advantage of the opportunity to uh, create a library. And do you think that that was because they hadn't yet realised the importance of a library in terms of providing education and um, giving people access to, well, social mobility and, and, and all those kind of things, which, of course, nowadays we very much associate with uh, free public libraries? Mm. Had that connection not, not been made yet? Or was there perhaps a feeling among the elite that they didn't want everybody with having this power of being able to read and i don't think that was if that if that sentiment existed i don't think it was sufficiently widely felt to to be a sufficient barrier i think it was partly that uh, the sense that uh, there were already very many demands on people's uh, tax contributions and they should have the choice whether uh, they used the library or not and that brings home another point, which, which is absolutely integral to this story, and that is that uh, a lot of cities weren't actually short of libraries. From the 18th century, you had people banding together in what were subscription, called subscription libraries, where members decided what books they got. Then you had circulating libraries, which were... Uh, run often by booksellers who lent out books as well as selling them, which provided precisely the sort of books that um, customers wanted, um, because if they didn't, they went out of business. Whereas there was always a fear with the public libraries that they would be um, rather like the sort of first charter of the BBC, um, that they were to educate, instruct and entertain with far more of the instruction and uh, and, and uh, information than than the entertainment. And indeed, there was a considerable prejudice among the first generation of librarians about giving people thrillers and easy reading fiction, rather than giving them improving literature. Yeah. 
and in, in many of the early public libraries um, that they had they provided separate reading rooms often uh, one which would be dedicated to newspapers and journals uh, which were indeed very popular if a library had those but there were always um, uh, mass worries that if you had one of these rooms and it was integrated into a main reading room you would get the unemployed basically coming in uh, to be uh, reading newspapers looking for jobs and, and, and making a nuisance of themselves so even in those places um, like Manchester, which did take up the Public Libraries Act and, and establish the public library, there was always a real concern of now that we have a public library, which is indeed open truly to the public, what kind of public are we actually getting in? And you know, what are the books that were that were uh, providing for them? Because there was, a, as Andrew just mentioned, a real sort of missionizing sense of we want libraries because we want to lift people up. We want to edify them and instruct them and, uh, and, and help them out. But this was often a, a very paternalistic vision of, um, of how to do so. Um, I should add one further adversary to the public library movement here, uh, and that is uh, that was the um, uh, the Brewers Union. <laughs> and often um, in sort of local, when you had these ratepayers referenda to determine, you know, do we want a library in our community? Often there would be counter campaigns uh, sponsored by the local brewers. Uh, because they were worried uh, that if there was a library, people would stop going to the pubs and go to the libraries. And this is, and they they feared this because this was exactly one of the sort of taglines that the pro-library campaigners would use. You know, if we have a library, we will get the people out of the pubs, and they won't they won't be drinking after work anymore uh, and and spending all their money. They'll be improving their lives. Well, that it's interesting, isn't it? Because it is still very much. Um... Uh, the same thing happens today. I was speaking to the local librarian in our in my local town, and she was saying that they often get uh, elderly people in who, you know, they they want somewhere warm to sit. They want to read the newspaper. They want a bit of company. Often they, um, you know, are having problems filling out forms or something. They haven't got a computer. So libraries do fulfil that role today in society of being a kind of almost like a help centre, a community centre. And that's interesting that at the beginning, that was a big fear that that's, you know, that would be the role that they would play. There's so much to talk about, but I think we must push on um, to your second scene, which is um, in Bordeaux. How exciting. Yes, well, we're cross crossing the channel and, and uh, hopping over to France. And uh, we're in um, 1850 in Bordeaux, right at the centre uh, of town, downtown where the, there is the B Bibliothèque Municipale, the great municipal library. And it was, it was stopping here really because the Bordeaux Municipal Library is, is one of the largest public collections in France. And indeed, uh, in Europe at this time, it's got, it's got well over 110,000 books. Um, about one for every inhabitant of, of Bordeaux. This is a major uh, port city, of course, very famous for the, uh, uh, the wine trade. Really the great city of, the, of southwest of France. Now, why have we gone to, uh, to Bordeaux? Um, this was something that was very much uh, in the public eye in Britain. And in the two years before the Great Public Libraries uh, Act, there was a report submitted to Parliament uh, by the deputy uh, librarian of the British Museum, a man called Edward Edwards, in which he had a sort of statistical overview of the sizes of libraries around the world. And one of the key indications of this report was to say how poor British public libraries were, indeed the very few of them there were, uh, and how extraordinarily large and how, how extraordinarily large and diverse French libraries were. So every provincial French town had a library of tens of thousands of books, and indeed Bordeaux uh, was one of these largest ones. And the report was submitted to say, uh, we can't be falling behind France. I mean, this is, uh, we certainly can't do this. And later, the librarian of the British Museum Library, Antonio Panizzi, would exclaim in Parliament when he was uh, asking for uh, funding for his library, he would say, well, we must surpass Paris. So there is a real, in this period, a real sense of library culture uh, is a symbol of, of national uh, virtue and pride. Why does Bordeaux um, have so many hundreds of, of, of thousands of books? And indeed, it wasn't the only one. Um, uh, Lyon had over 110,000. Um, many smaller French towns had, had, had extraordinary libraries. But the, the thing was, is that if you were to show up at the Bordeaux Municipal Library in 1850, there's a very small chance, first of all, you would get in. And if you did, you would find a very poorly run, poorly maintained and abysmally badly catalogued collection um, in which almost all the books 
um, in which almost all the shelves would be filled with books that very few local citizens would want to read. So how do we get to this situation? Really, France had a very long and proud literary and library history. It was always one of the powerhouses of publishing in Europe since the invention of printing in the 15th century. It was famous for its royal library in Paris, for the princely collections, for wonderful university libraries, but most of all its monastic libraries. And the French Revolution in 1789 changed all this because the revolution uh, confiscated all monastic property, including its libraries, um, and then also confiscated the library or libraries of executed or exiled aristocratic nobles, the library of the king. And all of a sudden, in the space of a year, there were millions of books now in the hands of the state. What did the state do with these? There were many cases of, of vandalism and uh, destruction of libraries, ransacks, accounts of soldiers of the revolutionary armies, I quote here, lighting their pipes and, and stoking cooking fires with pages of, of books from these libraries. Um, but many towns, like Bordeaux, um, actually took these confiscations very seriously because they didn't want this chaos and rampage and uh, books from their town being sent up to Paris or being destroyed. So what did they decide to do? And this was supported by the National Assembly. Uh, they decided to pull all these books together and erect great municipal libraries. So all of a sudden, um, these French towns, which uh, many of them have never had a, a public library before, had some of the greatest collections in Europe. But crucially, they, they didn't really have the, uh, the, the, the staff to catalogue these uh, properly, to organise them properly, and crucially to do anything about the type of collection they had inherited. Because these were collections, uh, massive uh, amalgamations of very scholarly libraries, lots of theological books, lots of books from the 15th, 16th and 17th century, mostly written in Latin, really serious, uh, heavy tomes. These were not the types of books that the citizens of uh, Bordeaux would, would wish to read, um, the type of stuff that was coming out from, the, from the, 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 the printing presses. They wanted histories and travelogues, romances, journals, newspapers. Those were not available in these libraries because no real funding was given to them to, to expand them at all. There wasn't even funding available to organize what they had on the shelves in the first place. So we're left at this, um, this very strange situation where you have a country with, uh, in some might argue, the best libraries in the world, and at the same time also the worst libraries in the world. And this only really changes uh, around 1850, uh, because this is a period when one of the greatest book thefts in the history of the world is being discovered um, slowly by the French state. And it's all because of one Italian uh, librarian and professional book thief, a man called Jean Amon, who described himself as Count Libri. He, um, he had been a librarian in Florence, where he, and, and he, had, he had sort of left because he'd gotten into some trouble stealing books. But he found himself in France with an official commission charged with the investigation and inspection of French municipal libraries. Uh, literally sort of the fox in the hen house. And uh, Libri pulled this crazy coup by simultaneously criticizing all the dreadful conditions he found in these French libraries, and then also stealing the best books. And he pilfered libraries all throughout France uh, and then fled to England. And shortly before 1850, um, he sold more than 2,000 manuscripts to um, uh, Lord uh, Ashburnham, uh, for the sum of £8,000, a, a true fortune, um, almost all of which had been stolen under his watch from French libraries. And, and didn't anyone smell a rat when he came with his 2,000 manuscripts? Didn't Lord Ashburnham ask him where he got them from? Or <laughs> well, was he just pleased to get his hands on them himself? He was pleased to get his hands on them. Uh, but it should be said that, that Count Libri had some seriously good connections in Paris by this mm. point. Um, and he also had the fortune that none of the provincial librarians wanted to call him out on, on these books because that would only be to reveal their own stupidity and the disorganization of letting him take all these, all these books away. So they were caught in a little bit of a trap. And it, it, it finally became re revealed. Um, and it should be said Ashburnham actually and the Ashburnham family were, were rather noble in this respect because in the 1880s, they returned almost all the manuscripts uh, to France. Did they, did, did they get their money back? Uh, not as much time? as they paid for it, no. So, you know, they, they, they were pretty noble in this respect. But I, I, most of the manuscripts then did stay in Paris and didn't necessarily yes. go back to all the provinces. Mm. So, oh. you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of sadness to this tale. 
And you touch on something um, there, which is also a really, really important issue when um, when you're talking about libraries, which is, of course, is cataloguing. Because mm. if you go into a room and there's thousands and thousands of books, they're almost useless unless you can find out what's in there and, and you know, call one up or, or find one on, on the shelves. Um, and at this point, was 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 that was cataloging becoming a more serious and rigorous? Um... It was not yet reached the great age of cataloging, which comes in the actually after the uh, the public library movement takes off, when um, systematic cataloging and catalog systems, which can be applied in every library. Uh, took off. I think the real problem for these French municipal libraries is that they had inherited uh, hundreds of thousands of books which weren't plausible um, contents for a public library. Uh, They were antiquarian books, they were books often in Latin, so they're precisely not the sort of books um, that their readers would want to, uh, to get their hands on in a public library, but they were a huge conservation burden. And this continues to this day. I mean, we we worked uh, in in our early work in as many as three hundred of these public libraries, all of whom have a rare book collection, all of whom have a trained uh, rare book specialist trained in the French Library School. Now it's the equivalent of I don't know, you know, Swindon and Reading and Bognor Regis all having a rare book collection, which in the British system is unthinkable. Yeah, and so these books that we're talking about are still there in Bordeaux in the library. Well, apart from the ones which the Bibliothèque Nationale swiped when, <laughs> when they were coming back. And, apart from the good ones, then. And they are wonderful <laughs> libraries, and it is a, a, a source of some resentment to them that so many scholars concentrate their work exclusively in Paris when these are there are these wonderful collections in places like Bordeaux, Toulouse, Aix-en-Provence. Yeah, one of the treasures of Bordeaux today is uh, a copy of um, uh, Michel de Montaigne's uh, own work, owned by the author himself and, and inscribed by him, because he was a real, a real local of the southwest. Um, yeah. So no, they have Bordeaux has extraordinary collection of of early early printed books, but like Andrew says, as do many many other French libraries. Hi there, it's Peter here. UnseenHistories.com is now three months old and already it is packed full of enticing, illuminating and excellently presented historical material. If you give the site a visit today, you'll see many beautifully illustrated excerpts of books that we've featured on Travels Through Time. There's excerpts from Malcolm Gaskell's Ruin of All Witches, Nigel Pickford's Samuel Pepys and the Strange Wrecking of the Gloucester and Gary Shaw's Egyptian mythology, along with many others as well. For those of you who like maps, you might want to check out the utterly compelling series of pieces on the Battle of Fredericksburg in 1862. That was a crucial moment in the American Civil War, along with a range of fabulously colourised images from Jordan Lloyd. It really is history for our times. UnseenHistories.com so interesting. Can we move on to your uh, third and final scene now, where we're heading for the new world onto a steamer and we're going to New York? Yep, we're going to New York and here we're going to uh, uh, poke our our noses into the uh, Apprentices Library, one of the many libraries founded in order to help the, the young men who found themselves often on their own in New York and to give them some sort of sociability as well as an opportunity to improve themselves. And this, the foundation of the Apprentices Library, which takes place in 1820, though will be in their, their new reading room, which, which moved a few years later, it, they, it has lots of the rhetoric one would expect. The library, it was claimed by the chair of the library committee, would be one of the securities which we are planting around the Fortress of Liberty. Now, they insisted that these apprentices were 21 when they joined, so they weren't having any lads around, and there were quite strict rules. Uh, All boys admitted, the rules said, must have clean hands, faces and shoes, and sit with their hats off. Very important. And smoking and spitting were both prohibited. But as time went on, this became one of the great collections of uh, of New York. This 
also had a mercantile society library. The New York Historical uh, uh, Society had a library. The New York Society Library was the first created. That was a subscription library. And of course, there were many smaller circulating libraries. So the point we're, we're making here is that there is a reason why New York Public Library was not established till 1911. Because this great, vast, growing city was already very well supplied with libraries, which fitted with particular constituencies and where the collection could be built around their needs. And can you give us a, a sort of a, a, an example of the kind of books, this Apprentice Library, for mm -hmm. example, um, what kind of books were, were, were they sort of in, instructional books that would about, about the different trades that these boys were apprenticed in? Or were they more uh, uh, novels and um, entertainment kind of books? Well, there's, in all of these libraries, there's attention. I mean, it's the, the story of library histories through all the time that the readers tend to want uh, novels, and those putting together the collection want to nudge them towards more improving material. And they sometimes go to extraordinary lengths to do this. In some public libraries in in the UK in the first years of the 20th century, they would hide the novels interspersed with uh, non-fiction titles in the hope that they'd be drawn to the non-fiction title. Um, and here you can get a clue from a speech at the opening of the new reading room where this was recommended on the basis that libraries were places which place mankind on an equality in all that relates to genius and intellect. That is, if you were uh, had the talent, the library would help you to make everything you could of yourself. But there is a sort of gradual shift from the instructional literature in trades, which, as you suggest, formed most of the first stock, to the popular novels, which, like everybody else, they all wanted to, 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 to read. And so many of these libraries, the sort of apprentice libraries, the mechanical institutes, even miners' libraries, move from this rather portentous instructional mode to a literature of entertainment in the course of their lifetime. And of course, as the century progressed, these kind of libraries, is would they become more political? Is that where people started to access the works of Marx, for example, and, and, and that kind of... Was it connected with the in England with the Labour movement or am I barking completely out the wrong Certainly tree? in in, in, um, in England it's collected with uh, the, the Labour movement. In, in, in Germany, a lot of the best uh, libraries open to um, people from the industrial classes were, were trade union libraries. Um, I don't think Marx had that much of a... Uh, fan club in <laughs> New York at the time. Um, as time went on, the, the subscribers to to the um, uh, to the uh, Apprentice Library grew up, had their own businesses, and tend to be in it for fun, but also connections. This is the other thing these libraries provide. They provide a way to 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 meet and greet not only with people in their own generation, but older people who may be able to get give them a leg up in their trade at the same time. So this is not the place, by and large, where people are looking um, to build um, a, a sort of learning in political philosophy. It's more quite focused on, um, as Dale Carnegie said, how to succeed in business. Yeah, networks. Yeah. yeah. No, you, you really see around this time in, in New York is a very perf a great example of just the, the various um, um, symbols of the library, if, if you might call it that, the various functions. Um, because if you truly want to read uh, uh, novels and, and penny dreadfuls, um, you go to, 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 uh, to tobacconists on street corners and to little stalls and itinerant booksellers and, and bookshops who will sell these to you for um, very small sums or even sell you subscriptions to, to borrow books. Then you have the likes of the, uh, the Mechanics Library and Apprentices Library, Andrew's talked about, where, yes, they are as much social clubs and social functions, a way to um, to provide yourself a path to uh, a better life uh, or, or work, but not necessarily through reading. 
Um, and then you have the uh, on on the uh, on the highest end uh, a little bit later in New York as well. You have sort of great new princely collections associated uh, with the, the the robber barons who have made fortunes in the industrializing United States of America, who spend vast sums uh, getting uh, precious collections from Europe. Uh, the finest manuscripts uh, and rare books. So to, to affirm both the status of their achievements and of America's achievements uh, in the cultural world, and as a means to um, um, you know surround themselves with artists and journalists and and, and politicians, uh, and to demonstrate these uh, um, these wonderful materials to them. So you, in that sense, you have the whole encapsulation of you know why are people why do people like libraries? What do they see in libraries? We see so many things in them, but very often in the history of libraries, the reading of books in the library has has not necessarily always been the first function of them. No, and there's been lots of periods of history when it's been fashionable for very wealthy people who possibly haven't always obtained their wealth in the most ethical ways. But, but you know, as long as they're spending the money on books, it's got to be good. Yeah, books do have a function as reputation laundering. Yeah. Uh, and that has been the case, really, since the Roman Empire onwards. Yeah. And also just the prestige of being associated with scholars and having that sort of dimension to your life. Yeah. I think now I'm going to ask you uh, the final question. Uh, Andrew, would you like to go first and tell us if you could have picked something up from one of these libraries or places that we've been to today, what would it be? Well, what I would like, uh, please, is a uh, Victorian triple decker. In the um, mid-19th century, the publishers got into a sort of conspiracy with the circulating libraries that they would publish novels in three volumes. And the result of that was that the libraries could loan out a single novel to three different people at once, and it kept the prices artificially high, which meant that people couldn't afford the the novels and had therefore to join the libraries. So it was a sort of devil's pact between the publishers and um, the the libraries. Uh, But it had a huge effect on Victorian literature. You know, if you want to know why in the novels of Anthony Trollope there's that vast, yawningly boring passage in the middle where two minor uh, characters have a romance which goes nowhere. Um, That's because of the Victorian triple decker, because, you know, you have to fill out a novel to the the distance required. Uh, Now, of course, you haven't actually reached yet in 1850 the great age of Anthony Trollope and a lot, so... I'm a bit limited in my choice, but I, what I would like is a the history of Pendennis by William Makepeace Thackeray, and I found a lovely edition for you to send me, uh, <laughs> w- which was published in Leipzig, one of the reprints which are of English literature of of the day, published abroad in English, which demonstrated the extraordinary uh, power and attraction of authors like Dickens, uh, Thackeray, uh, and particularly Walter Scott, who was a worldwide bestseller. You shall have that. You can have it. Take it back to St Andrews with you. Uh, Arthur, what about you? Yeah, I'm afraid you've just committed to uh, to a triple decker for Andrew. I'm I'm not going to commit myself to a similar extent. Um, well, I would I would like to, uh, in my time travelling cloak, very much uh, present myself as the guardian of French libraries. And I don't mind which book it is specifically, but I would like to take with me um, one of the books stolen by Count Libri. Um, that didn't make it to uh, Lord Ashburnham and and, and wasn't returned to to France. Uh, There were many hundreds of books um, that just disappeared, you know, into the the mists of time. So saving one of those and being able to return it to its rightful bibliothèque municipal, that would be a Oh, that's lovely. So you're not even going to keep it for yourself. You're going (laughs) to... (laughs) <laughs> no, I'll, I'll I'll give it back. I'll give it back. Maybe a nice they can put a nice note in the catalog in the catalog <laughs> entry, which they I will force them to make um, to say that it was gracefully returned. I think that's very altruistic of you. Thank you both very much uh, for joining me today. It's been such a lovely conversation. Thanks very much. Real pleasure. Thank you. That was me, Violet Muller, speaking to Andrew Pettigrew and Arthur de Verdeven about their fascinating book, The Library. A Fragile History, 
which is on sale now. Please visit our website, tttpodcast.com, for more information on this and all of our other episodes. Thanks for listening. Until next time, goodbye.